Amen. Um, as you know, we've been blessed with some special pastors from Pastor Mark's church in Calvary Chapel, Laverne. And again, we have last week, we have Pastor Larry with us, He's going to share. Let's give a warm welcome for him. Thanks, man. Well, God bless you guys. Thank you, and good to be here again with you. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verses uh, 1 through 38. In these scriptures, we're going to see a lot happening. You know, it was the plot to kill Jesus, the last Passover that we would ever need, that would ever be needed. Instituting the Lord's Supper, which is so appropriate because we have communion and the disciples and throughout all this the disciples begin to argue back and forth about who's going to be number one isn't that crazy at such a solemn time i was thinking about servanthood and there's a famous preacher there's a story about a famous preacher who was speaking at a minister's meeting and he took time before and after the meeting to shake hands with the pastors and chat with them. And a friend asked him, hey, why are you taking so much time for a group of men that you may never see again? And this world-renowned preacher smiled and said, well, I may be where I'm at because of them. Anyway, if I didn't need them on the way up, I may need them on the way down. <laughs> No Christian servant can say to another servant, my ministry can't get along without you. And everybody's needed, all hands on deck, especially right now, as we see what's happening. And I'm so blessed and honored and privileged to be able to come out and share while your pastor is recovering. And that's what it's all about. Uh, not not uh, in, you know, in... Um, in 1 Corinthians, we talk about the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body being united, and there's many different parts of it. And I love this saying by Warren Wiersbe. He says, diversity leads to disunity when the members compete with one another. But diversity leads to unity when the members care for one another. And that's what we need to get back to. No more competing on whose ministry is overseeing this ministry or you know, none of that. Just all united for the common goal. And it's such a blessing to be here to to take up that mantle right now. So thank you guys. Appreciate that. Again, happy Mother's Day. And let's get into the message. Let's pray. Father, we come into your holy presence, Father. We get to enter into your throne room when we accept Jesus Christ. When we know who our Lord and Savior is, Lord, we get the privilege of and honor of being in the throne room with you. There's only one mediator between you and man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we don't need, we don't need to go anywhere else but directly to you. We thank you that we, Lord, can gather together right now at this time and share your word, which is so precious, Lord, because there may come a time where we're not able to do this. And Father, those days, uh, they used to seem... So far away but now lord we're seeing more and more how those days may not be that far away so help us to remember your word help us to have it written on the tablet of our heart because when these bibles are taken away one day father where will the word be so lord bless us today help us to leave father different than when we came in changed father and we came with father anticipation to hear from you. So we ask that you speak in and through uh, through your Holy Spirit, Father, even now to each heart, each mind. I know we want to get to the food for the day and everything else, but help us, Lord, to get through this food first, our portion, Lord, that's in you. We praise you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Luke 22. Let's start at verses 1 and 6, shall we? It says, Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called Passover. 
And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, kill Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them. And here's the key in the absence of the multitude. So for 1400 years at this point, Israel had celebrated Passover and the celebration was so stitched in the fabric of who they were. Think about your fingernail, right? It's embedded into you. And it's just like that. It's embedded into the very frame of their person. And it would be very easy then to see, if you think about it, how this society so steeped in tradition and set in its ways could miss the changes coming up on the horizon, forgetting about what it was uh, instituted for. And we can get like that ourselves, can't we? Coming to church on Sunday, we check the box, okay, I'm good for the week, rather than making sure every day we spend time with the Lord. I mean, why are we here today? Are we here just because our mom asked us to be here? Are we here, you know, for what reason are we here? Is it to hear about Jesus Christ and what he's done for our lives and what he wants to do in and through us? That's why we should be here because of what he's done for us, that we might hear his voice, that we might accept him not only as our savior, but as our Lord, is he our master? And are we obedient? So at this time that we're looking at, you can see how steeped in tradition they were and how they can miss what was coming up on the horizon. And again, we can do that. Now it's Thursday night going into Friday to us at this, at this point. But to the Jews, it was Friday already. Why? Because they go from sunset to sunset. Look at what H.A. Ironside says. He says, we need to remember that the Jews' day began at sunset. And it was after sunset on the 14th of Nisan that the Lord kept the Passover with his disciples. Before the next sunset, that is in the afternoon of the day following, our Lord himself died on the cross. He kept the Passover on the first evening of the appointed day, and he himself suffered and died as the true Passover before the next evening. According to the Jews' reckoning, both events took place in one day. Now, the design of God was that Jesus would die on Friday afternoon during the period between the two evenings. At that time, and it was between approximately three in the afternoon and sunset, at that same time, tens of thousands of lambs would, would have been being sacrificed at the same time he's crucified on the cross. Think about that. Think about the symbolism. Pretty amazing. Now, Passover instituted by God was to remember his what? His salvation. Remember, it was the death of the firstborn. And he told everybody to place blood over the doors and the sides so that he would pass over them. That's what it was about. And so that was what they were to remember. And what happens every week when you guys do communion here is to do it in remembrance of who? Of Jesus. Don't let it become habitual. Let it become real every week, preparing your mind and heart and remembering what our Lord has done, especially as the days draw near for him to return. May we remember that. So this is the last Passover. Think about it for a moment. These guys, as we get to see this, these guys get to be at the last Passover that's ever needed. The last one. I don't know that they realize that. We get to see the whole picture, right? We're blessed. We get to see the whole picture. But did they realize that? All other Passover feasts prior to this one looked to this one. Can you imagine how amazing that is? This is when Jesus would institute what we call the Eucharist. And think about embedded, how embedded it was into their nation at this time. And society, they can miss 
these changes that are coming on the horizon. And many did. Many did at this time. And if we're not careful, we can miss what the Lord's trying to tell us right now, what he wants to do, especially those who haven't accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. We can miss those things if we're not looking in the right places, if we're not looking for the right thing. When we look into the tomb and we don't see Jesus anymore, where do we see him? He's ascended. He's risen. That's why we get to look into the tomb. That's why it's important we must look into the tomb in our hearts and remember that he's no longer there. He's ascended. He's in heaven and he's coming back for who? For me and for you. And praise God for that. We go on here at verse 7. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house, which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover? with my disciples. Then he shall show you a large furnished upper room there make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them and they prepared the Passover. Now what was happening here in this whole scene? Jesus is moving in and out of the city in the evenings, right? It wasn't his appointed time yet. This is when the crowds would die down. Mary, got to remember there was you know, many people, hundreds of thousands of people in Jerusalem at this time. And so when there's less observers, and when the crowds would die down, there's more sin usually at night, isn't there? So the crowds would die down. He'd go out at night because they were looking for a way to get him. And it would be the perfect time to take the Lord out it would be the perfect time to take him at that time. And so what does Jesus do? He wants an undisclosed location to celebrate with his disciples one last time. And here's something interesting is only Jesus knew the time and place right now. And he only shared it with Peter and John. And he only shared it right before it happened. And sometimes isn't that what the Lord does to us? We want to know the time, the place, the date, all the details before. But there's a reason, I think, that the Lord doesn't do that for us, just like with these guys. I mean, think about it for a moment. Had Jesus shared with them prior to all of this where they were going to do it, don't you think that Judas might have conferred earlier? Maybe got it done sooner? And it wouldn't have followed along with what the Lord's plan was. Maybe it wouldn't have been done on Friday when all the lambs were being slain. God always has a reason and a plan, doesn't he? Always. We don't think he does, but he's sovereign and he allows things. Is he not in control today? He still is in control today. But sometimes don't we live like he's not? We can get ahead of him. I know I know I can uh, many times. I like the picture because <clears throat> he doesn't share anything. It's that time and that place where God wanted it to be. And in chapter, we got to remember back in chapter 19, the triumphal entry. Jesus sends two of his disciples out at that time too, didn't he? So it's very similar. But here's some differences. At that time... They were told where to go, they were told what to do, and they were told what to say. Every step. Jesus gave them clear direction beforehand. And I think that's an interesting concept because as we grow in maturity in the Lord through sanctification, like right, we're justified, but where we walk through this life being sanctified and growing into maturity in the Lord. And at first there are many times where he needs to tell us all of the reasons why, but there are times as we grow in our life that we don't get to know all the reasons why. 
And we begin to have to what? Walk by what? Faith. And we have to trust. You feel like that today? Like something's going on in your life right now and the Lord's not giving you all the reasons? And maybe he's saying, son, daughter, I just want you to trust me. Walk with me. Let me take you into the next place that we're supposed to go. Because if you don't watch it, you don't listen to what I want to do, you're going to go ahead of me. And it's not the, my plan in your life is not going to be fulfilled. Is his plan in your life being fulfilled today? Or are you going on ahead of him? See, this time, this scenario, he gave them clear direction before, but this time in this scenario is different. He told them what to do, but not where to go. Pretty cool. Look at what they do, though. Well, before we get to that, look what they could have done. And think about this for your life. They have been walking closely with Christ for a while now. Maybe some of you have. Maybe some of you are newer. But for those of us who have been walking with Christ for a while now, he becomes familiar to us, right? Oh, I recognize this. This is what he's doing in my life. And what does that do? Well, that could be a dangerous place to be too because we want to be familiar with the Lord, absolutely. But the moment we try to put him in a little box and we think we have the recipe for how he works in our lives, doesn't he change it on us? And then sometimes we get this fear that we haven't experienced in a while. We don't know where he's going. I mean, these guys could have had a muscle memory type of faith. You know, muscle memory, you get in those habits and you know what to do, whatever it may be, maybe at your job or whatever it is, it's muscle memory. And we can have a muscle memory type of faith. And we can, if the Lord tells us something to do, we can spring into action. Oh, I know how to do this. And we think, oh, okay, I just step one, step two, step three. And we go through that process. We can do that. If we've been walking with Christ for a while, they could have at this time relied on their flesh. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, if Judas was still there, he could have said, Hey, Judas, how much do we have? You know, how much do we have in the box there in the money bag? They could have got the prize. They could have said, Hey, let's go get that place. It's beautiful. That's the place, you know, everybody wants to be. Let's go over there and rent that place out. But that wasn't what Jesus wanted. So they could have relied on the flesh. And we can rely on our flesh too. Going to places where we think that's where the Lord wants us to be. And it may not be. They could have relied on their sanctified common sense or their past experiences. Again, thinking, oh, I recognize this is how God always works in my life. So I know what he's going to do next. And then we begin to go down that path that we shouldn't be going down. We can't rely on those past experiences. But what's really neat is they give us an example here because the disciples, they didn't do any of that. For once, they're doing something, not for once, but they've done it a few times. But here they are saying, no, let's, you know what, let's pause. And we see them asking and we see them waiting. He gives them instructions and they say, What do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? And that's what we ought to do. When the Lord, when we hear the Lord pressing something upon our hearts, telling us where to go and what to do, we need to take a step back and pause and ask and wait. Because if we just jump into action right away, we may not be doing exactly what he wants us to be doing. And don't we want to be in his perfect will? I want to be in his perfect will. Let's let him be sovereign and let's wait upon him to give us the directions. See, because think about it, preparing the the Passover supper involved much more than just getting the lamb, taking it to be slaughtered and then roasting it. There were numerous items that had to be obtained. Like what? Like the unleavened bread, like the wine, like the bitter herbs and the apples and the dates and the pomegranates and the nuts and the cinnamon to make the paste for the unleavened bread to be dipped in. And so they think to themselves, well, we know all these things. We know that all these things are going to be required. 
And it could be like us. Well, I know what to do as a believer in Jesus Christ. As I read God's word, I know what the instructions are. And I know my calling, but where do I go? Where am I supposed to be using that? Where am I supposed to be using the skills and abilities that the Lord has given me to me? And we all have different things that the Lord gives us. We're all part of one body. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You'll see the diversity, the gifts that we're all supposed to be using. And we're all one body and we've all been given different responsibilities. But are we using them? And do we know where we're supposed to go? And I love what Jesus does. And he answers them with very specific instructions now as they wait upon the Lord. This time they wait upon him. Then he tells them. And then it's really neat, right? Because he tells them in these verses that they will meet this man who's carrying a pitcher of water and to follow him. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Think about, it's a pitcher of water, not wine or anything like that. Why? Well, I just like to step back and think, and this is more conjecture, right? This is just me giving my thoughts on it. I like to think of it as refreshing. The pitcher of water, it's refreshing. You're going to look for somebody who's going to have a refreshing word for you. Proverbs, why not wine though? Well, Proverbs 31, six says, give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to those who are bitter of heart. In first Timothy, we see it says no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So those were things, those were things to be used for, for infirmities, but the water is refreshing. I think about that when I don't know where to go. I know what the Lord's calling me to do sometimes, but then I begin to pray for guidance and for direction. And sometimes it comes through the oddest places. And it's like a refreshing drink of water. Maybe you've experienced something like that. Here's something else that's interesting. It was going to be easy to identify. Why? Because men didn't typically carry pitchers of water. And so sometimes the Lord does does that for us. When we will just wait, he will make it very evident. And it'll be very clear. And it'll be like refreshing to our souls to know. And what does that produce in us at that time? When we wait and we see those things, man, doesn't that create a boldness in us now to go with fervency? Like nothing can deter us from the task now because I know for sure, no matter if the doubts come, because they will come in our minds. But when we begin to see these things take shape, Man, I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing beyond a shadow of a doubt. Isn't that awesome? I love when the Lord does that in my life. He will lead you to a place like here when we see this man with this pitcher of water refreshing where I'm supposed to go. And guess what? The place that they went was what? Fully furnished and ready. Isn't that just like the Lord? Man, if we try to take it on our own, And we're striving and we're pushing. I mean, sometimes things come uh, with a lot of sweat. But maybe that's not the Lord. Maybe that's just us. I remember when we first planted out Surrender Church. I mean, we didn't have a dime. I signed a lease for a place. We didn't have money in the bank. We didn't have PA system. We didn't have chairs. We didn't have anything. And all of a sudden, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills calls and says, hey, we got 300 chairs for you if you want them. How did you even know I was planning a church? I didn't tell anybody. We found a place. We went to the school. And, our, and the custodian there was um, Ruben Vitali, And he became our worship leader. He was looking for a church to go to. His fa- he and his family. And then somebody called and said, hey, you need a PA system? I mean, it's just one thing after the other. And if you just step out, isn't that awesome? 
What's happening in your life right now? What is the Lord telling you? And are you waiting? And if he is telling you, and then he begins to give you those instructions, now are you going? Don't wait too long and miss out on the opportunities that God's given you. Why? Because in 1 Peter 4.10, it says, as each one has received a gift. Now, this is a command. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. This is the what to do now. It's the what to do. But how do we know where, Lord? I love this verse. And you might want to repeat it to yourself once in a while. Deuteronomy 12, 5. But you shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling place, and there you shall go. Where in your life are you seeking the Lord, and where is he putting his name in your life? Because that's where you shall go. That's the place. Where is that in for you? I can't answer that. That's between you and the Lord. That's the beautiful thing. So in our walks with Christ, man, we can have resources in abundance. We can have all the experience in the world. And we may, need, we may even know the what to do, but that doesn't carry over to where to go and where to do it. But we can go ahead of the Lord if we're not careful. And it could be a very simple test to see if we will pause, if we will ask, if we will wait, if we will listen. And his answer will come at the right time in the right place. And it'll be specific, won't it? I think about like footprints in the sand. Jesus will give us these verbal imprints to follow in our lives. And we'll be refreshed knowing what? That we're in his perfect will. Are you in his perfect will today? Doing what he's called you to do? I want to be, and I pray that I am, and I personally believe that I am, but sometimes, man, he needs to bring me back into the lane. A, a gentle rebuke, right? We don't like rebukes, but I don't look at the Lord as rebuking us all the time with a smack. <laughs> sometimes it's just a gentle grabbing you by the face and saying, hey, you know, I got you. Come this way. I love you. Man, I love when the Lord does that. Verse 14, it says, When the hour had come, he sat down, Jesus, and the twelve apostles with him. And then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they begin to question among themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing. This is known as the last Passover. And Jesus instituted what we call communion or the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, which is just a Greek meaning to give thanks. But we make these big words, right? Make all these big words to make it sound more holy and, you know, but it just means to give thanks. And that's what we're doing. Giving thanks for what? For what, here, for what he was about to do. But for us, we're on this side of the cross. For what he did for us. What a calm in the middle of, all this turmoil surrounding him. Think about what's going on. Here's Jesus having this last supper with his disciples. Meanwhile, outside and even inside with Judas is all this turmoil. I mean, Jesus was keenly aware of what was coming. He knew where he was headed. 
but he has a, all this calm in the middle and he uses it as a time to do what? To witness. And we should do the same thing in times of turmoil or to count it all joy when we encounter various trials. Yet we sometimes just fall apart, don't we? Oh my gosh, look at me. It's a big problem. And, we get into this mode and we forget who we are in Christ and that he's going to take care of it. I don't mean to minimize the issues and problems that we all go through because in our minds and in our lives, they're huge. They're big. But in the bigger scheme of things, are they? I mean, in the United States, how rich are we? We're very rich. Very rich. I am blessed to know that should the Lord tarry, I get to go home and sleep in a nice, warm, comfortable bed tonight. What about you? You have a refrigerator with food in it? You have the opportunity to go to this McDonald's? I think I said that last week. Why do I keep thinking about that McDonald's right there? I don't know. Chicken nuggets or something. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> But he uses it as a time to witness what an amazing Lord we have. What an example we have with all this stuff going on in his life. And he's like, guys, I just want to talk to you about what's going on. And I care about you. What an example of the Lord uh, to us. So Jesus institutes this new covenant in what we're about to do soon in remembrance of what he was going to do. And for us, remembrance of what he has done. And Paul, Paul gave us the order of this supper and how we do it today in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim what? The Lord's death till he comes. The Lord's death till he comes and he's coming again. Amen. And he's, he's doing what with his bride? He's adorning his bride. I was teaching in Titus on Wednesday night. And you know what that word is referring to adorn? It's the word we get cosmetics. And he's getting us prepared for his return. Are you being purified in heart and mind right now? Ready for him? I pray that you are. You see, for us today, we, we, when we take communion, we, it's a very solemn time. We don't want to take it lightly. And for those who don't know the Lord, we pray that they don't do it. We pray that you don't do it. But see, we get to look back at our lives and what we were taken out of. We get to look within to examine our hearts and prepare. And then we look ahead. Look ahead to what the Lord wants to do. And so now Jesus announces that his betrayer was among them. And so they're all wondering, they're all sitting around the table. Doesn't that, doesn't that amaze you how he wasn't even recognized? He wasn't even recognized. He walked, uh, he talked the talk. That's what he did. And he tried to walk the walk. It's interesting that I, they couldn't identify him. I mean, Matthew and Mark in the book of Matthew, Mark, it tells us that they asked Jesus, is it me? You know, is it me? I ask myself that sometimes, or I don't want to betray you. I've already turned my back on you before. I don't want to do it again. Is it me? But when Judas asks, is it I? Jesus answered, it is as you say. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it began the next day, the Sabbath, and it was a seven-day festival. And by the time that the Lord introduces the fourth cup at this supper, the cup of joy, Judas is gone. This is what we read in the book of John. And prior to that, Jesus is telling them that one of them is going to betray them. And then if you read the book of John, Peter is sitting on the other side, or the way that they had it arranged, he's sitting where he could see John. And it's like he, Peter motions to John, hey, ask, ask him who it is. you know, Because we don't want to always ask the Lord, right? We want to ask the Lord sometimes to the, say to the people we think are closer to Jesus, hey, you know, ask Jesus for me. 
you know, when he says what? We can come directly to him. Just ask him. And so Peter motions, hey, John, ask him who it is. And so John asks, and Jesus says, it's the one who gives him the bread after he dips it, and he gives it to Judas. And this is when, this was Satan's point of entry into Judas. And in John 13, 27, he tells Judas, do what you need to do quickly. Now, this is important because at the time, the cup of joy, at the time that we celebrate communion, Judas was not present. And that's important for us today because it's only those who know Jesus as their Lord and Savior that can take part, in, part with this. We recognize what he's done. We're saying we're in oneness and unity with what the Lord has done. That's why it's very important. Now, how did the 11 respond? In John 13, 28 and 29, it tells us, but no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him to go out quickly. For some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. Now, how did they miss such a solemn moment? Think about it. I don't know. Did Jesus spare Judas at this time? I mean, we'll see in the last few verses here that they found these two swords, right? I mean, think about if Peter would have found those swords before. You think he might have taken Judas out had he known it was him? I mean, that wasn't part of Jesus' plan. I mean, doesn't he guard us from ourselves sometimes? We need to be careful. Maybe they missed this whole thing because they didn't really care what was going on. Maybe their mind was on something else. Was it a genuine question? Did they really want to know who it was? Because if they didn't want to know who it was, no answer Jesus would give would perk their ear and cause them to be attentive. Do we do that sometimes when we're in our prayers, asking the Lord for things that we don't really, it's just something that we just always do, but we just don't really put any thought into it. We don't really care. I mean, my son and I were talking about that this morning. He came downstairs and I said, hey, how's it going today? He said, fine. You know, same as usual. And then we started talking about how some people just ask that question just to ask it. And then when somebody starts really telling us how their day is going, we were like, oh, man. You know? <laughs> I didn't really. It was just a question. You know? Relax. <laughs> I mean, in conversation, small talk is curtailed by premeditated by our premeditated agendas. I just wanted to make you feel special for a moment. Like I care, but I'm really thinking about this over here. Right. I mean, do you do that? I do. I've been, I can do it. Somebody you going to come up and say, how's your day? <laughs> I use this before, but it's like, you know, we, we just have this conversation and we, like a like a building a sandwich, right? We don't care. We just want to get to the meat. That's all we want. Again, there's food, right? I'm always thinking about food. But personally, for me, I think they missed it because their minds were down the road already. Their mind was on something else. And we see it in the next few verses. And here they are sitting with the Messiah. But they're ready to get back to the way that it was thinking that Jesus was going to bring the scepter back because they thought the scepter was gone. Thinking that Jesus was going to set things right before Rome, that he was going to take them out and set up his government right here, right now. But why do you think this was happening? Probably because of what happens next. Look at verse 24, where it tells us, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Where's the focus? On me. On myself. And isn't that the toughest thing for us? I'm always thinking of me, myself, and I. John completes some of the pictures for us in his gospel. But we head back here to Luke. We've been jumping around a little bit, but we find these guys in dispute. And it was a common dispute for them, wasn't it? Remember, they talked about it in, back in Luke chapter 9, verses 46 and 48. 
Matthew 18, 1 and 5, Mark 10, 35 through 45. This is where we see them do these things. And it's sad because they just had a very solemn moment. You know, Lord, is it me? Is it me? Am I going to be able to do that? And Jesus, can you imagine how grieved he was by the fact that Judas is the one and he just called him out and nobody's even recognizing it, not hearing what Jesus is saying to Judas. And here they are. You know how saddened he was because you remember he had to select Judas to be one of the 12. And now this guy's betraying him and the sorrow in his heart. But these guys are so into their own pride and their own ambition that they missed the whole thing. They're missing what's actually happening. And we can do that if we're staring at our lives too much, staring too long at what we want can be blinding. It's this excessive fixation on personal longings that we have in this world. We're trying to build our kingdom here when Jesus tells us to build it elsewhere. Not here. Not here. I, you know, think about this. Please don't get mad at me, but it just comes up in my mind. I think about those stickers that say, not of this world. Have you seen those on cars and stuff? And so you'll pull up and you'll, and, and this massive four wheel drive, huge, brand new, it's got every bell and whistle, but it has this big sticker on the back that says, not of this world. Not of this world. It looks like everything else, everybody else's car. And that's what our goal is. That's what our desire. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love to have one of those personally. <laughs> you know, what did you? I think they're awesome. But are we, are we of this world? Or are we not of this world? What's our pursuit? What is our pursuit? Do I know every piece of that? vehicle, all the custom parts more than I know God's scriptures, that I know the, the word of God. This excessive fixation on the world. It's like staring at the sun too long. It can burn our retinas and selfishness burns the retinas of our conscience. We become concerned only for our own vision and not what God's plan is for our lives. We want the way it was. Think about the way that church was before this pandemic. And do you ever sit here and think, oh, I wish it was this way. I wish it was that way still. Man, don't you want what the Lord wants for you right now? What new thing is he doing today? We pray things that get back to normal when the Lord says to what? Put on the new self. Put on the new. Don't look back at what he did yesterday. Thank God for those things that he's done. What's he doing today with you and with me? Let's move forward in that. Are you ready for the new? Not the way that it was, but the way that it is. Because remember this scripture, Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. He says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do what? A new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Yes, are these tents getting old and frail and you hurt and you get up in the morning and your knees hurt and you're shuffling to the bathroom because, you know, you got to go? I mean, yes, they're getting old, but your spirit, do you still think you're 18 in your spirit? I pray that you do. I, that's what, how I feel until I see the mirror. But I pray that you do. Your spirit's fresh. You're alive. And God's got a plan and a work still for you because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the end. And let's keep going. Verse 25, it says, And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom 
just as my father bestowed one upon me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus goes into this short story. He's comparing them to Gentiles for a shock factor. Because what did they think about Gentiles? They're down here. Don't compare me to those people. But he's comparing, he's giving a shock factor. And Jesus once more is reminding them that in his economy, in his will, in his ways, in his kingdom, greatness is the very opposite of man's idea, isn't it? He reminds them of what true servanthood is, and that's the lower seat. Do you know the way that Jesus looks as, at a pastor up here teaching? The servant. We don't, we don't sit out there thinking that all the time, right? Well, that's a pastor, you know, respect, reverence. No, this is a lower seat, or it ought to be. It should be. That's the way I see it, and I believe that's the way that the Lord see it, sees it. He reminds them of the true, of true servanthood. Look at him. Look at his life. And our Lord and Savior gives them this gentle rebuke, a gentle correction. Hey, guys. Get your mind off yourself. I know you want all these things. I understand. But for, you know, let's get back to what the real work is. This is a gentle rebuke. I love you guys. And I'm reminding you of what's important. That's what he does to us. Reminding, reminding us of what is true servanthood and of utmost importance. He's reminding them about the kings who ruled over the Gentiles and they ruled all over the Gentiles only in title. It was only in title because there wasn't really any care. They were commonly viewed as great people. And again, their greatness was only in title. But check this out. And I love this saying, the lust for place and power is inconsistent for a disciple of Christ. Did you hear that? The lust for place and power is inconsistent for a disciple of Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. When we're all trying to climb the ladder above everybody else. When we're supposed to be going down further underneath everybody else as a servant. Can you imagine what the world would look like if we all did that? If we all did that, it'd be sickening, right? Too kind. <laughs> we wouldn't be used to it, but what a blessing it would be. The kingdom of God is the only kingdom ever known to man, where the greatest are those who take the humblest place. The place where the church needs to get to, where it needs to go back to. Matthew Henry writes, Those are the best those are best prepared for the life to come that sit most loose to this present life. What are you attached to? See, Jesus demonstrates servanthood. He had just washed their feet, remember, in the book of John, it tells us that. And not just the 11, but all of them. Judas' feet. He, he put on the cloak of servanthood. And Jesus then, in his words, gives them, gives them this preview of the millennial reign of Christ that we see in Revelation 20. That could be homework for you on your own they would actually eventually be rewarded. Remember, he tells them, hey, those things that you're worried about right now, you're actually, that's actually going to happen, but not here, not in this kingdom, not in this lifetime. Isn't that neat? Here they are, our ambition and pride. He gently rebukes them, and then he says, it will, don't worry about it. I'm going to give you those things, but not right now. All these things we worry about are comforts, money in the bank, food to eat, clothes to wear. The Bible tells Jesus says, that's what the heathen worry about. Hey, you're going to have those things eternally. Hey, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? My Lord. And he will give you and I our portion. If we're seeking him, if we're in his perfect will, focus on that. They would actually be rewarded and have a prominent place. And if your name is written in the book of life, so will you and I. 
And like he does, like Jesus does so many times, he changes things up on the way we see things and on the way they saw things. And he reminds them once more of servanthood and not the way it is, but the way it should be. And again, Jesus is an example. As we move on here in 30, verse 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Now, Peter, think about this. You're, you know, he doesn't know what Jesus is talking about here, but we do. But we do. When, you, when I return to you, what do you mean? Man, that's a whole other story that we can get into. We move on. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times that you know me. Isn't it comforting to know that Jesus prays for, for you and for me? Holy Spirit making intercession. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Romans 8, 33 and 34. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Jesus' prayers, if you think about it, are always according to God's will. And what does the Bible tell us when we pray according to God's will? We have what we ask for. And so Satan may ask for each one of us by name to sift us out. But if we are his, he prays for us. He's praying for us. He makes intercession for us. So awesome. And even when Satan asks for us by name to see if he can sift us out, Jesus is praying to us for us according to God's will. And God will not always spare us from life's problems, will he? I mean, I've had problems. Have you had problems even though you've been a Christian? Absolutely. This is where old character, though, is chewed up and spit out. And the new is developed. And our new character is shaped and refined if we will allow the Lord to do the work that he wants to do in and through us. This is what we call Christianity 101. You got to know these things. This is what's going to happen. Isaiah 43, 1, and, 1 through 3, it, it should give us comfort because it says, You are mine, and when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Does he tell you, I'm going to throw you over the river so you never have to go through it. No, he doesn't say that. Does he, does he tell you you're never going to be burned? No, he doesn't say that. I'm going to be there with you. I will help you through it. And we need to remember those things because when opposition becomes to hit us, comes sometimes to hit us, we begin to think, oh, where's the Lord? He must have gone. But what does he say? He never leaves us nor forsakes us. So he must be here somewhere. He must be with me still. Let me go back and walk with him. Verse 35. And he said to them, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? I mean, remember the narrative that's going on here. These guys are thinking about, you know, well, who's going to betray you, Lord? And they start talking about all this ambition and pride comes and all this stuff. And now Jesus is saying, hey, you guys are going to be humbled, man. You need more humility. He said, hey, remember these things? And he said, so they said nothing. Verse 36, then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And he who has no sore, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressions for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, if we don't 
if we don't examine what was happening here, we'll never get the right picture. Because we're thinking, oh, there's two swords, let's go take them out. That's not actually what was happening. See, Jesus sent them out before, if you remember. He's saying, hey, remember when I sent you out, told you not to take all these things? See, he sent them out before to test their faith. They went out with nothing. God provided for them. He said, stay in the first house that you come to. Like, don't look for anything else. You'll be provided for. And so after that experience, they were so overjoyed with the experience because they had performed miracles and they healed people. Remember that story? It was at a time where it was like a a tailwind type of serving. I mean, you have a tailwind behind you and it's pushing you and propelling you forward. Oh, this is so nice. Wind at my back, propelling me forward with ease and serving at that time made complete sense. And it was joyful and, you know, it was a blessing and, oh, I got all the accolades and everything was provided for me and serving Christ was fun at that time. And it's always fun without the headwinds of opposition. There will be time when serving won't be fun, but it will always be a joy if it's done in the right heart. It will always be a joy. And it doesn't matter what opposition will come. And now Jesus is saying, hey guys, it's going to get harder. It's going to be different. Those times have gone. It's going to be different. Do you find things becoming different today? I mean, you as a Christian, if you thought you didn't, if you thought you had opposition before, I mean, what's opposition in the United States? Really? I mean, somebody looks at us funny, we get all hurt, you know? Is that opposition really? He needs to, we need to get tough. We need to be toughened up a little bit. And remember what Jesus is saying here. Jesus didn't want them to be misguided and unaware. He doesn't want us to be unaware. He wants to prep us. We need to be prepped and shaped and molded for what's coming ahead. He had already told them earlier that persecution was coming. If you read the chapters, the temple would be destroyed. He shared with them apocalyptic events were going to intensify And his arrest and death would trigger persecution of all of Jesus's followers. They are no longer, they would no longer be welcomed. They would be hated. They would be persecuted. And many of them were. And it's like Jesus saying, guys, those days are done. It's time to mount up. Time to get to business. More solemn. That's what I see happening in the church today. Shaking it up separating the wheat from the chaff. Many churches are closed now. Where are they? What are they doing? Many people don't come anymore. I don't know what's going on in their lives. We pray that the Lord is still ministering, that he's still using them, but were they ever serving the Lord at all? He's adorning us. He's getting us ready for his return. It's time to mount up, time for business. See, Jesus is about to leave them. His earthly ministry was ending, and they were about to enter into into a new phase of serving him. And they would be exposed to what? Poverty, hunger, danger, and he wanted them prepared. And it's like us when we start out serving. When we start out serving, we accept the Lord, and we got all this fire in us, and everything's so clear uh, than it was before. And every day serving the Lord is sunshine and rainbows until things get tougher. At that time in our lives, it's like Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And you're like, yes, I love serving the Lord. It's such a joy until somebody comes up to you and says, Hey man, your message stinks that message you gave was terrible that's happened to me thanks (laughs) you know thank you please don't do that to me today you're gonna hurt my you'll hurt my feeling no but it's like that it's gonna happen i don't know what about some of you do worship people ever make comments to you 
oh man, you could, that was good worship, but you could do this better. You know, those things happen. People have such a great heart. I get it. But see, that's the time. Those, we have times like that, but closer to the end, those days are going to fade out like the morning mist. If we don't learn to walk with joy in trials right now, our faith will fail. Initially, we may go out with sunshine and rainbows and come back with joy, but that kind of service may turn into sowing seeds through weeping and through tears. Like one of my favorite Psalms, 126, 5 and 6, those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually, continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So it's going to get harder. The work still needs to be done. I think the disciples here like when Jesus tells them to buy a sword. Right? We do. Hey, get a sword. Yeah, I can get behind stuff like that because I want to take people out. Right? Do you want to take people out sometimes? And we can do that. Now, did he mean for us to pick up our weapons and go on the offensive? Like many people are doing today? Well, I think that would be contrary to his character and to his teaching. How do I know that? John 18, 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Matthew 26, 52. All who take the sword will perish by the what? Sword. Luke 6, 27, 31. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Hey, regardless how they treat you, you treat them how you want to be treated. That's Jesus' teaching. Jesus is saying, look, I sent you out before. I provided for you, but you're going to be going out soon again. I'm not going to be there this time. And things are going to be different. It's going to be tough. Before you received, you're going to be rejected now. You're going to be in prison. You're going to be hailed before the courts. And you're going to have persecution. And plainly, it's just going to be hard. You're going to have to learn to die to yourself. The Lord makes a reference to the prophecy here, given in Isaiah 53, that he was numbered with the transgressors. But it doesn't refer to Christ being crucified with two criminals or associating with sinners during his earthly ministry. It refers specifically to his death in place of sinners. He's numbered with the transgressors. He's replacing what we should receive. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Taking our place. Amazing. And the disciples, here they are. Lord, look, here are two swords, man. We're ready. Right? Can you just see Peter? Man, I'm ready. I'll take another guy's ear off. I don't care. Let's go for it. And Jesus said to them, it's enough. Not nice, let's go. No. He was literally saying, that's enough of that kind of talk. Knock it off. That's not how the kingdom of God is going to come in. Their future would not depend on them. It would depend on God. He fights for us, not the other way around. Where do we fight? On our knees in prayer. And today we have this vast galaxy of internet channels, podcasts, all of these things going on around us. And you can name those who you watch and listen that cause you to want to fight. They bring this anger up inside you and it wells up inside you and you just want to go take somebody out. Democrat or Republican. Doesn't matter. On both sides, you begin to think that way. 
And let me, let me tell you something as a Christian. Let me just remind you of something. You begin to feel that way towards somebody. If, and the person that the people that you're listening to and that rises up in, in you, turn it off. Because that's not Christ. That's not Christ. The person that stirs you up to fight physically is not a person who's fighting on his knees spiritually. I guarantee his walk is not where it should be. Is that, am I saying that we all need to be passive and not do anything? No. That's between you and the Lord. I can't tell you what to do. But I can tell you what Jesus' character is. And I can tell you what the Bible says. And then you have to examine your own heart and ask the Lord what he wants to do. He used old Matthew Henry again. He writes, if believers were left to themselves, they would fall. But they are kept by the power of God and the prayer of Christ. Our Lord gave notice of a very great change of circumstances now approaching. The disciples must not expect that their friends would be kind to them as they had been. Therefore, he that has a purse, let him take it, for he may need it. They must now expect that their enemies would be more fierce than they had been, and they would, need, they would now need weapons. At the time, the apostles understood Christ to mean real weapons, but he spake only of the weapons of the spiritual warfare. The sword of the spirit is the sword with which the disciples of Christ must furnish themselves. Sword of the spirit. Word of God. We may be going to days where Bibles will be taken away, but we, are we ready to fight that battle? Do we know God's word? James 1, 19 and 20 says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not what? Produce the righteousness of God. Things are changing in the church. And the way that we've done things have been embedded in us. But I don't think things are going to go back to the way that they were. And we can no longer say that, oh, I can't wait till things get back to normal. Are they going to get back to normal? I mean, because all we're saying is, I want to go back to with what I'm comfortable with. But maybe the Lord doesn't want us to go back that way. And he wants to do a, a new thing. And the serving of the Lord may be changing, and it will get difficult. But we need to adapt to continue to reach out to the lost in many different ways. The American church has been sitting in the pews way too long. It's time to get back to the work. And are you ready? Are you prepared? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for your examples. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we come into your presence, Father, again. And thank you so much, Lord, for speaking to in and through, uh, uh, through our lives by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you change our minds and our hearts, Father. May we draw closer to you. And Father, as we begin to receive the offering now, Father, we lift it up to you. We thank you for providing our every need. And Lord, we thank you for these wonderful people given to your church to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that we as a congregation, Lord, would remember that it's not just the pastors and the worship leaders' uh, responsibility to share the gospel. It's us, Father, as we get in here and we are discipled, we're to go out and we're, we're to spread the good news, especially in the days that we're living in. But our responsibility isn't to change anybody. That's the work of your Holy Spirit. That's why we need to be on our knees in prayer. So we pray, Father, that uh, uh, you would help us to do that with more boldness, Lord, especially in the days that we're living in. Father, we thank you for the offering. We, As we get ready to do communion together, Father, we pray that you would prepare our minds and our hearts now uh, in Jesus' name. Amen.